So you may have heard that down at Memorial Rock that our, our speaker system didn't work this morning. Um, and so I had this idea that I was going to, you know, stand behind the, the stone lectern down there and read. Um, but, but when it realized that I would have to kind of shout, I decided, oh, to get behind that and just, just go off script and do it all. And that's what I did. Um, and it went very well, although sometimes I did mess up and call Jane Hirschfield Mary Oliver. Um, so, so if I do that again now, you can just shout it out. You listen for that. So what... Um, so what this is, is this is the second year in a row that I've done something that I'm hoping will become a tradition, which is a service in the spring in, on a beautiful May day, a poetry service. Um, I read poetry practically every day. Um, it is the kind of the closest thing that I have to a regular spiritual practice. Um, and so I'm hoping this becomes a tradition because I enjoy it. Although, um, you know, it depends on you. If you find the idea of a poetry Sunday in May to be pleasing, um, you'll let me know. If you find it displeasing, you'll probably let me know and, and I'll tell you that you have bad taste or something. <laughs> So last year what I did was I actually selected a handful of poems by um, uh, Kabir, the Sufi mystic poet, and by Ross Gay, a contemporary African-American poet, and by Mary Oliver, and I'm getting that right, and by Jane Hirschfield, and put all those poems in conversation with each other and let the poems sort of talk to each other. This year we're doing it differently. We're doing um, one poet, um, and I'm introducing you to the, the poetry of one poet, Jane Hirschfield, uh, who also happens to be my favorite poet. Um, it's good to be the minister. You get, to, you get to influence things with your bias, I suppose. Jane Hirschfield was born in 1953 on East 20th Street in New York City. I love when they do biographies. and you're, When you're born in New York City, they give the street that you're born on. Um, she graduated from Princeton in 1973. She was a part of the first class of women allowed to attend Princeton University. And 1973 was a really, really good year for her because she also had uh, her first poem published that year to, to great acclaim. Um, she was widely understood to be an up-and-coming poet. However, unexpectedly, she decided uh, at that point to give up poetry. She moved to San Francisco and she entered the San Francisco Zen Center where she uh, joined with that community and spent the next eight years of her life dedicated to practicing Zen Buddhism. She was ordained in 1979 as a Soto Zen priest and at that point she began, returned to poetry. Um, her first book of poetry was published in 1983, Alaya. It's, it's out of print and very hard to find. Since then, she's published over the next uh, 23 years. She's published seven additional volumes of poetry, uh, all of which I've, I've read and have loved and have treasured. Uh, she's also uh, the author of a number of other books, um, uh, nonfiction, prose, um, essays about poetry, and um, she's done some translation of uh, women's religious poetry in Japan into English. So she's introduced to the English-speaking world um, some uh, women's Japanese religious poetry. What I like so much about her, what I like so much um, about Jane Hirschfield's poems is that they are not easy. They're not simple. They're um, not obvious. And when I say that they're hard, they're not hard in the sense that they can contain, you know, 50 cent words. You'll never find yourself having to go to the dictionary to look up what word she's using. They don't contain obscure literary or historical allusions that most of the world wouldn't get. They're, the words are plain and the, the grammar is plain, but the poems are hard. They are like a Zen koan in the sense of a simple, a simple statement that'll leave you thinking and rethinking and rethinking and questioning. Take her poem, The Promise, 
that Linda read for our meditation. The poet says, stay to the cut flowers, and the cut flowers turn their heads away. Stay, she says, to the spider who flees, and stay, she says, on and on to this and to that, and everything leaves. And finally she says, stay to my loves. And they answer, always. And they just sit with that. What is that saying about love? Is love tragic? Is love all-powerful? What is it? And, and you, you sort of reflect on it, and it can mean, its, it's meaning is not obvious. It doesn't tell you what the meaning is. I want to read another one of her poems. Um, there's going to be two kind of qualities that I really like to her poems that I want to draw out of. Um, and those two qualities are, first, that she leaves room for the surprise the miraculous, the, rev the revelatory, the graceful to kind of enter into our lives. And then the other thing is that she, she writes about the circles and the seasons. Um, and and that is a, that's a feature of her writing too. But first I want to uh, share a poem that I think is a little bit about this idea that, that the unexpected, the surprising, the miracle can break in. What is usual is not what is always as sometimes in old age hearing comes back. Footsteps resume their clipped edges, birds quiet for decades, migrate back to the ear. Where were they? By what route did they return? A woman, mute for years, forms one perfect sentence before she dies. The bitter young man tires. The aged one, sitting now in his body, is tender. His face carries no regret for his choices. What is usual is not what is always. Not ungraspable hope, not the consolation of stories, only the reminder that there is exception. And I find this kind of inbreaking of the miraculous and the wonderful into life to be something that flows through her poems in that uh, poem theology, which I love. There's this sense, there's this woman crawls under the porch, drags out the dog, says, no. The dog says, okay. Everyone hurries to believe it. And so there is this sense, there is this sense that the, the world has contained far stranger things than this as poet Sarah Lindsay says. And I think this idea of kind of the inbreak, the breakthrough, the moment of revelation, the moment of enlightenment, the moment of grace, use your theological term that you will, is something that is an important, um, something that is important for religious liberals to remain mindful of. I, I think that what kind of describes us as religious liberals is that, that we are a, we're a people, we're a, we're a type of people who kind of maintain some sense of, of optimism or hope or faith for the world. That we don't kind of, kind of give in. That when, when someone says, oh, you know how this is going to end, the religious liberal says, well, there's possibilities. When someone says the leopard can't change his spots, say, we believe in, in change and transformation and change is a possibility. When you believe there is, there is no way, we kind of hold this, this open-minded and open-hearted sense that there is more possibility out there. And, and if we hold on to that, if we hold on to that, then um, we're, we're kind of taking a, sta a stance that is, that is faithful. And so that's the first thing that I want to say. I really love those, those moments of, of breaking in. What is usual is not what is always. The other part of her poems that I really like is, are, is her attention to the cycles of nature, her attention to um, the cyclical nature of things. And I find um, that sort of throughout her poems, um, 
and there's this notion that, that we might call, you know, things go from, from left to right and from black to white. She uses often the metaphor of a heart, systole and diastole, to describe kind of the working. Um, her poem, A House in Winter, which I didn't read, contains a whole cycle of the year um, from, from the, the plant to the peaches it grows, to the harvest, to the peaches in the jar, in the cupboard, to the peaches empty, that, that everything happens within a circle, within a, a yin and a yang. In her poem, The Door, that, uh, that I read at the very beginning of the service, there is that as well. There is um, that image of of the, the first scuff of footstep, you know that there will be a second scuff. The owl's repeating call, you know an owl calls once, it will call a second time. And then she says, the two beating heart, systole and, and diastole, that will kind of embody us. And what this says to me, what this says to me, um, and evokes in an understanding of the world, is this idea that, that our world is never or, or seldom linear. It isn't one step of progress, followed by another step of progress, followed by a third, followed by a fourth until we get it right, but that it's you know one step forward and two steps back and two steps forward and one step back. That the politician we love gets elected and the law that we've been waiting for gets passed, and the Supreme Court makes the most beautiful and well-reasoned decision. And then the politician we abhor gets elected, and that crummy piece of legislation gets passed, and the Supreme Court, how could they do something so stupid? You know that? That's just, this is the... This is the cycle. This is the cyclical nature. And so um, what, her poetry, what her poetry really, really says to me is it talks about this, this sense of that, that there's no action without reaction. There's no stance without resistance. And what this, uh, what this means, what this means to me at least, is not that you know, we should take a step back and just watch the pendulum swing and sort of absent ourselves from anything. Because that's a, that is not an optimist. That's a pessimistic position. But it's this idea that, that in the middle of it all, in the middle of it all, we need to keep a wider perspective on the world, that this victory that we treasure and claim is not the, the final word, is not a guarantee that all is right, as well as this defeat, this thing that we throw up our hands with and think, how could we do that? That is not an indication that the world will always follow that trajectory either. It calls for a larger view of time and history. It calls for a larger sense, and it calls for the ability to be self-differentiated, to not be defined by one stance, not be defined by one decision. And the paradox of that, the paradox of that is with that yin-yang, is that the more we want control, the more chaos that evokes. The more we want to have absolute authority, the greater the anti-authoritarianism will be. It's a it's a yin and a yang, and I think that is from, from her Eastern religious training. I think that is alive in her poetry. In every owl's call, there is another call. In every diastolic beat, there is a diastolic beat. In terms of, uh, in terms of those two awarenesses, I invite you to kind of play with those and see how those live in you. Um, I invite you to, to read poetry. Um, I invited the, the, the first 
service out at Memorial Rock, I invited someone to go try to find me her first book of poetry, which is out of print, and I had two, two, two reference librarians who are working on that now. <laughs> but I want to invite, I want to invite you, um, I want to invite you, if you're searching, if you're a person who is, who is maybe unhappy with your spiritual practice or is searching for a spiritual practice, I, I invite you to consider poetry as a possibility. Um, and not just the reading of. I invite you, I, I believe that, that poetry lives in all of us. We don't have to spend eight years in a Zen monastery to write poems. We don't need to travel to the top of Mount Everest or the uh, Cape or wherever to write poems. That I invite you to, I invite you to uh, if there's a poem in you waiting to be, waiting to be let loose, to, to let that poem loose. And those are my thoughts on, on Jane Hirschfield's poetry this morning. And thank you. Thank you for, uh, for uh, allowing me my bias of choosing the poet that I love. And, um, and I've heard some suggestions for, uh, for, for poets next year. I didn't, didn't get Mary Oliver's name in there, did I? No, not too many times. All right. We're going to do um, a closing. So when, when, Glenn and I, uh, when Glenn and I talked earlier, um, <clears throat> it, was, it was interesting. So we... Um, we wanted to find hymns that were easy to do down at, at Memorial Rock. And so I thought about hymns that are like, come, come, whoever you are, and I know this rose will open easy rounds. Um, but I thought of another hymn that, that I very much wanted uh, to do, and it's a hymn that I'd only sung um, a cappella before or, or without, without a whole lot of... Um, Without a, without a whole lot of accompaniment, although the, the cellos are going to be accompanying us on this, and I'm thankful for that. Um, the hymn is, is number four. It's in there. It's, it's I brought my spirit to the sea. Um, and, and all the time, I've never sung this, this hymn in church before. I've only sung it standing on the beach in Maine as our voices try, at a, at a universalist conference center, as our voices tried to rise above the seagulls and the crashing waves and the wind blowing off the ocean. Um, and so it has, uh, I, I find it to be a poetic and a beautiful hymn, and so I invite you to rise in body or in spirit for our closing song of the morning, I Brought My Spirit to the Sea. <laughs>